thanks Steve for uh, agreeing to uh, appear on the Ocean Sailing podcast. I when I, I got a bit of a bit of an intro um, of your story and your background uh, from Julia, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and to be honest, I get I get lots of people who who contact me who say um, you know I've written this book about sailing and would you like to do an interview and 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 you know usually usually the the, the reasons aren't compelling enough. Um, but when I saw you know your background and your story um, and the couple of a uh, couple of big adventures you've had um, and the uniqueness of it, I thought it'd be, you'd be a fascinating person to talk to really. Um, okay. Because um, I mean, there's going off the bed and track and then there's going mm -hmm. off, off, off the bed and track, um, which is where your travels have taken you. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm glad you picked up on that. So uh, no, absolutely. And um, I was able to, uh, uh, she, uh, Julie sent me a um, PDF of the, of your um, book um, on the five year voyage. And so I did some speed reading through there to get a real feel and okay. flavor and taste of taste of some yeah. of your adventures and challenges. Okay, so you you you've skimmed the new book, yeah, but perhaps not, perhaps not this one. Not the three year, uh, three years and twelve boat book. No, no. Okay. So um, okay. great. Well, um, thanks for thanks for uh, getting together. And what what time is it where you are? It's one p.m. Okay. And are you in Washington? State of Washington. Okay. Great. Um. So, well, why, why don't you, why don't you take me back to the beginning? So, you had, where did all of this start? Like, way, 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 way back. What led to you saying, "I want to do some some crazy adventuring in small boats"? Hmm. Well, I guess I'll start when I was a young man, and well, my first real adventure was my first big adventure was the right out of high school for a year. That was hitchhiking and motorcycling in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then I worked in my profession of city planning for about 12 years and was ready to go on another adventure. The wander list had built up enough, and I decided that um, a small boat would be the, the way to go. I had had a boat or two before, and I had had some boating experience in my, in my, in my childhood. But um, boating was not my only thing. I, I would perhaps just as well, you know, hike or go mountain climbing or something like that. But boating was best, best source, I believe, for what I wanted to do. And um, so, well, there's uh, just kind of zeroing in on the amount of detail that, that your listeners might want. The, I decided to design my own boat that was going to be 30 feet long, but then circumstances caused me to change it to only 12 feet long and a 12 foot long boat is so light and small that the the crew weight that is just the weight of me starts to just overpower everything else mm -hmm. and you have to it, it's no longer necessary to uh, have the boat be self-writing but but it has to be writable by me and um that voyage then i built it designed it and built it and and went on that voyage um involving the rivers of north america and then coastlines in Panama and Colombia, then going over the continent of South America with um, portages by, by car and truck, because this boat can be put on top of a car even, down some rivers in Colombia and South America, and then through the Caribbean to get back home. <clears throat> the the five-year voyage, the new book, is similar in that it's a very minimalistic small boat, but it has to be a little bit bigger because it's for two people, me and my wife, instead of just me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that being a longer voyage with a bigger boat, we went further. <laughs> but And it's with two people, so it's uh, a little bit more, um, less lonely, more happy, more colorful, more bright, um, but but a equally ambitious voyage where we, where we covered a lot more terrain. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Okay, so so take me back to um, when you when, how I mean you met Ginny, and then from there, I gather the conversation went. Hey, I did this trip once, and it was awesome. Should we do something like this again? Um, right, a bigger boat. It'll be yeah. great. Like how, yeah. how how did you meet, and how did all that all that develop in terms of the right. discussion and the commitment to doing it together? Because you were you were you were a couple at that point, but you weren't married, were you? Um, no, no. We, I was a city planner. I worked for a small city in their city hall she also worked in their city hall we we had some professional dealings and then she had read my book but didn't really 
think too much about one way or another until we be started um, like going on hikes together and um, started to become boyfriend and girlfriend. She then pretty much said, I would be willing to go on some kind of big adventure with you. And in fact, due to her circumstances, she sort of said, that's what's, what it has to be. Otherwise, I'm going to just move out of this state. I'm tired of what I'm doing. She wanted to move on. And so it was almost like an ultimatum. And, and I happily gave in to her ultimatum and said, okay, I guess I'm ready too. You ready? Are you ready? You really ready? And she's ready. Okay. Well, then I'm ready too. <laughs> so she had no boating experience, but she had, um, she had sort of an outdoors person experience of being able to pack and camp and being prepared she was a capable person of things like that but but she yeah. had to be taught how to sail mm -hmm. okay and so and then what developed next was that the did you do you think about where you were going to go next and what you were going to do or did you think about sizing up the boat first and figuring it out after well yeah at that point now we had to decide what kind of voyage and what kind of boat and the our our pictures changed actually there was a lot of mission creep occurred we at first the idea was um to go to the atolls that are off the coast of the um of mexico and belize the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the western caribbean we have atolls similar and and great and coral reefs such as you have in in australia and um so the kind of boat that would get us there that was what we were thinking and um that could have been either a, a multi-hull or a a uh, shallow draft monohull. We ended up with a shallow draft monohull, the, the sea pearl, and we spent a year modifying it for the purpose. Some some rather intensive targeted modifications, and um, that ended up being suitable. But when when we went down there to those atolls off Mexico and Belize, we had a great time. But the, we found the boat to be so capable that the it, it and it was all just clicking so well that we continued and that's where the mission creep occurred we we continued down to the southwest corner of the caribbean which is panama and then we chose to uh, continue in an easterly direction to venezuela and then we got into the rivers and then things really started happening okay okay so just um before we jump to that so just tell me back to the the and and to, to answer your earlier question um our listeners love the detail, um, so don't feel you have to skip over that. Um, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a five minute slot where you've got to just stick to the big picture. Um, so the modifications to the boat, so the Sea Pearl um, design. What what modifications did you have to do, and how you know how, how did you go about those? All right, very good. Um, the Sea Pearl is a twenty one foot reproduction of a design by the son of the two Herrschafts, and. It's to be described that if you look at it floating in the water, it looks sort of like a classic look. Um, it has no hard shines, but um, what's under the water, what's under water line is what matters. And it's, um, it has a slight amount of rocker, but it has no sideways roundedness. It is flat in a transverse direction. And it's chines, if you wanted to call them that are rounded. So that's just sort of a unique shape to it. That gives it a very shallow draft. It has about a, six inch to eight inch draft depending on your loading mm -hmm. and um so it is um comes that is the sea pearl comes as an open boat it has some side decks but and it has a cockpit which is um uh is is, is self-draining but the main volume of the boat is just one big open hold or hole mm -hmm. and um so the main the main modifications were one to build a rigid cabin top that would enclose that hold and it is relatively short it it doesn't have far from being standing red headroom it doesn't really even have sitting headroom it has sitting headroom headroom in the sense that if you're sitting on the bottom of the boat with your bottom on the on the floor you have sitting headroom yeah it's yeah. not sitting not sitting in a chair we don't have any chair you know yeah. so then um for the next thing was that um we we installed um stowage and tankage as four inch tall tanks and four inch tall bins that are sitting on that flat floor enough enough tankage for 18 gallons that's all two people need 
for say 10 days mm -hmm. and enough bins for bringing, you know, rice and tools and epoxy and stuff. And they are all held down very forcefully by um, aluminum floorboards. And so in the case of um, capsize, they are held in place. So mm -hmm. all that stuff is, is the ballast uh, there. It is not a ballasted boat. It's very light. It's very, very, very tender, mm -hmm. but this makes it somewhat better. And um, then we built a, uh, uh, well, we bought and modified, put in place a sliding seat rowing station that goes into the cockpit. Now the cockpit is um, not very big. It takes up the whole cockpit when you are rowing. So you only have it there if you are rowing. And otherwise you take it off and kind of fold it up and cinch it down a certain way to get it out of the way because this boat has no motor. It's a sailboat. And um, so you need the rowing as your auxiliary power. And um, that, and, and then that was the case for two of the five years, but the last three years, we also got a, a two horse Honda, the one that's an air cooled, the lightest model you can get of an outboard motor. And that's what allowed us to go into the rivers. You know, obviously you have to go up river and there aren't suitable winds most of the time. So yeah. that, that was our river river um power mm -hmm. okay and then um and then it took a little bit of the work out of going upstream i guess and then you had to find fuel fuel storage as well on, on board to stow the fuel mm -hmm. um but yeah but two horses pretty it'd be pretty economical oh very we it would be something like one pint per hour yeah right a cup yeah. even you know yeah just almost nothing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and so okay so and you got started on your adventure and then i guess the, the chapters just kept unfolding as similar to the analogy of sailing out over the horizon and then seeing the next horizon in front of you and, yeah and um and so i guess yeah how how tell me tell me about how all of that developed really and, and where okay. it took you and, and i mean i'm what fascinates always fascinates me is you know the some of the the off off the bed and track terrain that you had to deal with and some of the mm -hmm. things we take for granted um like for example anchoring in swamps and mangroves and rivers and reefs and but also some of the some of the culture you encountered um sure. some of the wildlife you encountered some of the some of the security challenges you may have encountered so just uh, yeah, tell me about those things okay well uh there's two very different types of uh navigation involved here there's the saltwater portions of the trip getting to the riverine portions and then there's the river portions and so to address the, the saltwater portions, you're well, we're following the, the coastlines of Florida, Cuba, Mexico, Central America, Colombia, and Venezuela. And um, it's coastal, sometimes following, however, islands that are offshore, and obviously Cuba and crossings to Cuba and then from Cuba to Mexico. Um, so there are longer crossings. The crossings are not pleasant. The, this boat is not intended for ocean crossing. Mm -hmm. And um, however, the boat is safe enough and you know it's able to withstand a capsize. And um, so we made these crossings as necessary, but we minimize them by always finding refuge, uh, you know, uh, when at the, at the end of the day, whenever possible. And those refuges might be a regular harbor of some sort. They might be, <clears throat> um, they might be a, coral lagoon or coral reef with a lagoon but there's a pass suitable so we can get through the surf at that one spot where there is a pass it might be a river mouth that's deep enough that the surf isn't breaking at the mouth um etc you know that's the kind of things you're looking for or the lee of an island and um that um <clears throat> involved a lot obviously a lot more heavy sailing this is this is the caribbean it's a windy part of the world and um then we then we get to the um, uh, we got to Venezuela and we moved into the river system. <clears throat> the the rivers are just very different situation. You you have uh, a contrary or favorable current. At first we had contrary, but at any rate you have a current that here again it's two very different kinds of scenarios. You're either going up or you're going down. If mm -hmm. you're going up, you um, you need that motor. Some sometimes you can sail up upstream sometimes yeah. the winds are suitable to that that's the exception mm -hmm. and but you need the and there's too much current to row you can't row against 
against that kind of current and, and the kind of boat we're talking about. So you need the motor. And we had, that's what we're using the two horse for. It, it served well until it broke, then it didn't serve anymore at all. And we got a, um, uh, it's in, in Portuguese, this is in Brazil now, they called a little tail. I'd more call like a long tail. You know, it's where the motor is sort of, and the, the whole assembly of motor and drive shaft and propeller are balanced at their, at their balance point on a pivot. And then the whole thing has like a tiller. So you hold, move the whole thing and you immerse the propeller and move it around to steer it. You know, this is more common in other parts of the world, but it's, it's what they use in Brazil as well. Right. So we got one of those for um, more of uh, the next part of the trip. Mm -hmm. And anyway, then, <clears throat> so now this is in the rivers of South America. I'm talking about a lot of rivers. Well, there are so many that um, I can't even remember them all because if, if you consider each tributary, one flowing into another that's larger, flowing into another that's larger, they all have different names. But just to name some the larger rivers, there's the, there's the Orinoco going upstream on the Orinoco through mostly Venezuela. And then it reaches a mystical one, one time only, the only place in the world where this happens, where you go up one river and high up in its watershed, um, which is in the Guyana Highlands or the Guyana Massif, part of the Orinoco peels off and just kind of, they're, they're kind of, there's a saddle involved and some of it goes one way on the saddle, now that goes the other way. And so you can just go up and then turn ref on a turn right on a disk tributary, and then you're in the Amazon. So this is a backdoor way to go to the Amazon basin. This is the most, most back of the back of the back. This is the most remote part of our voyage. This connecting riverway is called the Brazo Castiquiare. And it's, um, it's in Venezuela, touching up against Colombia and Brazil. And it flows into the, um, the Rio Negro, which is a tributary of the Amazon. Now, if you want to hear about wildlife, this is where the most, for a whole week on that Brasso Casipiare, we saw no people or houses, except for in two occasions, we saw people in a boat. Mm -hmm. And we saw a giant anteater. This is an animal seven feet long swimming across the river. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw a <clears throat> cougar swimming across the river. And these other animals, I forget what they're called, that have spots on them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it's one of the beauties of that part of the world is there are no mosquitoes. The, the Baso Casiquiare is the same as the Rio Negro in that, you know, Negro means black. It's a black tannic acid water. Mosquitoes do not thrive. You don't have any mosquitoes. That's a major advantage of that right. part of the world. The Rio Negro is the supreme place. The Rio Negro has, for example, the world's largest fluvial archipelago, an archipelago of islands that uh, number in the hundreds or thousands. And they, they're often 10 side by side. So if you look at the map of where you are, there is a channel that's a mile or two wide. And then there's an island that's a mile or two wide. Then another channel, island, channel, island, channel, island. And the whole thing is say 40 miles wide. This is a big river and nobody lives on any of those islands. And you can go through any of those ways you want to go. You can go through any of those different channels. So it's yeah. there's not much by way of navigational hazards either. It's just uh, a free for all. It's just uh, go anywhere you want to go. We were there in the um, high time of the high water tide time of year, and all those islands were inundated. The, the trees weren't entirely inundated. You know, you can see the taller trees. The top half of them might be sticking up. And um, so you can literally go right through the forest in many occasions. You, you tie off at trees at night and the, the river is streaming you away from these trees, you know, right. you're just camping in the forest, not camping, you stand on your boat because there's no land or you can get to where there is land, but um, you'd have a lot of interesting options. There's a lot of, um, a lot of variables there that are really interesting. The, um, all the insect life that was on the land has gone up into the trees. And so when you tie onto a tree, you better make sure that that line that goes from the tree to your boat passes underwater. Otherwise, everything that's on that tree will come onto your boat. And it could be like, <laughs> you know, 100 pounds of ants, which is millions of ants. Oh, right. But you'll wake up and your whole boat is, is like an inch thick of ants, literally. Oh. And it'd take you a long time just to shovel them all off. Mm. Um, bees will, will make nests on your boat. Mm -hmm. um, 
anything, you know, anything mm-hmm. will come on your boat. But it's generally not a hazardous situation. And the, um, the water is clean and um, safe to swim in. Uh, the piranha really is not a dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I'm kind of just moving along here. Do you want me to zero it? I'm, that kind of describes the, the river portion of it. Another thing to explain is that with all these different rivers, sometimes they flow into another one into another and you just obviously go into it. But in many occasions on 13 occasions, portages were required to get around a dam, around a uh, rapids, set of rapids, or to get from the headwaters of one river to the headwaters of another river, which are the closest possible. And in each of these occasions, we um, simply looked around. We, if there is a marketplace, you go to the marketplace because um, pickup trucks bring produce there or pick up produce and take it away. So that's where you might find a trucker. You yeah. talk to that person, you, you make a deal. They, 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 then this, our boat, see our boat was um, just small enough that this is possible because being 21 feet long and about 800 pounds, you might say, um, it is possible to either put it on top of it. Oh, well, let's put it on top of a flatbed truck of a certain larger size or yeah. put it on top of any boat trailer, et cetera, you know, different ways that are not very complicated uh, or expensive. And then, then you pay them a few hundred dollars, 100, 200, 300, whatever it takes, and you get, around, get across to the next thing. And it was affordable to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. we made 13 such portages. Mm-hmm. Wow. And what did you, um, what sort of currents did you experience in these rivers? And did you strike? Um, f- flooding and heavy rain at any point? Did you, you know, t- tell me about mm-hmm. those things? Right. Well, the currents are um, generally not too big of a problem. Um, they, the cur- typical currents are one to three knots, four mm-hmm. ma- maybe. And mm-hmm. so it's generally not a problem, but there are rapids. Most of the rivers have ra- rapids in their middle or upper or, or their upper um, levels. Um, like if you go upstream half their distance, you might find a set of rapids. And ra- the rapids, obviously, we could not ever go up through rapids that are faster than the top speed of our boat with a motor full open. Um, so that's, that, that's what chose our route. We were able to, the Orinoco has rapids only in one stretch that were too strong, but there, there is a road that parallels the river with an input on both sides of those rapids you see mm-hmm. this was obviously something that was constructed for that purpose you know yeah. it was so that people that boating could occur to a certain point and then there'd be a land transport and then back into the water so there's a way to to get that portage and um uh then um coming downstream you don't have as much of a restriction you are able to then it's a matter of what you can shoot, you know, that you're going down rapids of a faster speed, but you don't want to go through anything of such turbulence that you might capsize or something. Mm -hmm. So there you have to decide how much you can handle of a different sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, the scale of rivers in 40, we're saying 40 miles wide. I mean, it's a, that's huge. Um, Yeah. That that would be during the inundated time of year during the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and how much how much of your trip was spent um, sleeping on board versus sleeping in you know your tent on the shoreline somewhere? Right. Well, we slept aboard almost all the time. We down in the tropics, it's really hot there, of course. And this cabin, as I've described to you, is very small, and just the body heat given off by a person makes it too warm at night for two people. So uh, Jenny would sleep in the cabin with a mosquito net over the companionway hatch i would sleep in the in the cockpit in a curled up position with a different mosquito net draped over me and with an awning over the both of us if necessary to keep out any rain and um we did sometimes sleep ashore because there were occasions in the saltwater portions of the trip where we could not find any um suitably calm place to sleep the the sea pearl just just rocks and and rolls too much to sleep if there's any kind of wave so there were times when we slept on shore we would anchor the boat within waiting distance go on shore pitch a tent and we'd be better off then because the tent obviously has a mosquito net 
Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then there were a few times when we stayed at a hotel for some reason, but that was pretty rare. <laughs> Hey, they have to be nice. Have to be nice for a break sometimes, I'm sure. Um, and we haven't really touched on it, but what sort of um, cooking facilities and toilet facilities did you have or not have aboard? Right. Um, well, the the stove was a camping stove, the MSR Dragonfly, just as you would take on a hike. But we had a little um, aluminum box, sort of, that it went into, so it holds the stove and the pot that you're cooking in. That's mm -hmm. a helpful thing. And we used a, um, a pressure cooker, the smallest mm -hmm. size. It's only 1.5 liters, just enough for like rice for two people. Yeah. That saves on fuel. Um, problematic here, the, the MSR and similar stoves are meant for certain kinds of fuels, mainly white gas or Coleman fuel, which is unattainable, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So you're always using other types of fuels, which are very frustrating and, and very um, inadequate, but there is no other kind of stove that met our needs that we could figure out that, that where that where the fuel for those things were available any better than what we had. So we yeah, we suffered through that. We we cleaned our stove a uh, um, hundred times, you know, during the course of the trip at least. Mm -hmm. um, there's no bathroom facilities involved whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's just all natural there. <clears throat> It's, just, it's good for people to understand the minimalist nature of um, the, the adventure you uh, you undertook. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and and then in terms of people and civilizations, and what what did you encounter along these rivers in terms of the uh, the scale of the population? Were they tiny tiny yes. villages or yeah, it is farms? it is quite fascinating when you when you're traveling <clears throat> the rivers, you <clears throat> run the gamut from big cities with skyscrapers to the most remote, just a single house, say, you know. And um, so there are, and then you find towns that maybe are of a middle size um, that they could be 50,000 people, say. And then in that town is a little island of civilization. That town has streets with cars in them, but those cars can't go anyplace else except for that town. There's no nothing connecting it to any place else. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, the, the indigenous people are, are often the most commonly met people and they, um, <clears throat> they may still dress in their native way and they may live in somewhat native house, houses. We, we met people of the Yanomani tribe, if I'm pronouncing that right, and another tribe, the Karajas, and there's so many and each one speaks a different language. Um, and, they they may just go in dugout canoes they may have a motor on their dugout um they but some wear western clothes so it's a variety and um then <clears throat> there are people who are not indian or or their heritage would be a combination of native american and <clears throat> and european or black there are parts there there's three there's three races of course in latin america there there are the blacks the native americans and the and the europeans and they've all mixed together in different ways mm -hmm. Okay, and and uh, how much of your time and your travels was spent, I guess, a, a, a immersed in culture or immersed in towns and villages or m meeting people that you got to know, you know, more than just in passing? Right. Okay. Um, I would say we had a bit of a focus more on uh, getting the job done and getting through and making some progress, but we were never in a big hurry and we enjoy people. So we, we would kick back and get to know people um uh there would be but usually there's another reason to slow down you're also fixing something and provisioning and so you know you're there's plenty of opportunities to to meet a lot of people a, a common occurrence is that when you come to a, a town that you need to reprovision in um and these are by the way either spanish speaking or portuguese speaking because Brazil is bigger than the rest of South America put together, both in area and in population. So we actually learned Portuguese just during this trip. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, you'll come to a town that uh, then you need things and there's the whole range of things you need. You need to know where the laundromat is and where there's drinkable water and there's a big long list. And hope, often you meet somebody who's interested in you and they, they say, I have a car, want me to take you around? <laughs> and so, yes. And uh, 
they they show you stuff and and, and become become you become friends with them. Mm -hmm. So um, there were times when we, we stayed six weeks in one place. Yeah, there's plenty of times when we were in one place. Okay, um, okay, that's fascinating. And and I mean some of the some of the encounters you had, I, I guess. I mean, it's you weren't the normal kind of people passing by on the river every day. And so did you have did you uh, have a lot of um, curiosity about what you're doing and were you did you have any security challenges at any time mm. well yeah we uh we were robbed at knife point in costa rica um we had i believe a coast call in honduras that that part of the world for some reason seems to be the most like i met i don't know if i did say it. i've been i've been robbed at knife point three times in my life and it was all all three of them right in there costa rica panama and colombia right mm -hmm. in that that triangle and um, so yes to that, but um, mostly you don't have problems. And um, <clears throat> uh, what was the other part of the question? Security, um, you always have that in mind. When you, when you come to any kind of a place for a stop, you, you have to suss out um, where to put the boat. And <clears throat> this is a boat that has no dinghy, okay? It's a small boat therefore you do not have a dinghy you have to um, get the boat to a dock or a place where you can tie to a branch or a place where you can um, anchor in, in wading water and and then go get onto the roads or the streets and get into the town but people could come and rob your boat so you have to think in those terms um, usually they're pretty good because these are boat landings where if you're landing your boat in a populated area um, there are other boats that are landed there and boat landings are usually kind of like the honor of the fellow boater they're yeah. usually usually okay mm -hmm. um, but it is worth thinking it through mm. okay and um, I mean did you in terms of charts and navigation did you have a high level of detail for what you did or were you would do were you, you know were you lacking in detail and just right. having to just go in a general okay. group to figure out yes very, very worth explaining that. I, I think this is quite interesting. In the saltwater portions of the trip, of course, we had access to all, you know, the digital maps. And all we used uh, in terms of, well, we didn't have a chart plotter. All we had was a handheld GPS like you use for hiking. And we had, we had a way to mount it in front of our faces on the mizzen mast. And um, so we loaded the charts to that. And uh, that's how we navigated there. But when we got into the... Uh, the rivers of South America that you have you have there are no charts you know for gar by Garmin or anything like that and of course you have paper maps of those countries you can get a paper map of Colombia or Brazil they don't that might be suitable that might be enough in 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 my three years in a 12-foot boat that is all I had and I and I did all right but um in this in this new the the five-year voyage that's in the day of the internet and of course, we don't have internet underway, nor do we have cell phone coverage. We might have a cell phone that would work in whatever country we're in, but underway, we don't have cell phone coverage. So um, what you do or what we did was we, these towns have cyber cafes. You go to a cyber cafe and you begin a, a process that will typically take 40 hours, man hours of um, zooming and panning in Google Earth the, where you're going to go right. and then using a, a click of um, digital or um, vector art to create your own map, you're, you're recreating by tracing over the top, the coastlines, the rivers, the islands, you'll, you'll click in there where a town is because you need to find that town in order to reap the vision. And then you take that d vector data and you um, make it into a map that will appear on the screen of our little GPS and that screen is only two inches by three inches, so it's not much. But because you're not able to save any any of any of the of the imagery of the satellite imagery, all you have is that little map that you made. It's your own map, yeah. and so we, we used our own maps and we 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 navigated by our own maps in that sense. Mm. Wow! From city planner to river planner. <laughs> well, then we actually got so used to it, we really liked it because. You spend, like I say, a lot of long time. If you're going to go like a thousand miles, you'll you'll spend maybe 40 hours doing this. Well, that whole time, you're looking at where you're going to go from a satellite image point of view, and you're getting 
you have no idea of the depth, but uh, that is the relief. But you have a you, you're thinking through as to the kinds of well, where are the rapids? Uh, where yeah. are the towns? Where are the dams and so forth? So you you start to familiarize yourself with the train ahead of you, and it really is helpful. Um, there was one one portion that was particularly challenging, and that's that um, when we got into the Rio Paraguay, we got into it just above where the Mato Grosso starts. The Mato Grosso is a swamp about 200 miles wide by 200 miles wide. It's as big as my home state of Washington. It is, um, it is a maze of um, waterways and lakes and there's rare, there's no land anywhere. It's emergent vegetation. There's, there's vegetation coming up out of it, but there's no land in this whole vast expanse. And there are um, waterways that you can follow and you have to zoom way in there because they're, most of them are dead ends. You zoom way in, you, you try to follow one that continues. And um, that, that ended up being a little bit easier than we thought. We didn't know for sure which of all these little things we were mapping were going to take us through and not get us lost. Yeah. But when you actually get there, it, it turns out that the Rio Paraguay, which flows into the Mato Grosso and comes out of the Mato Grosso, has a current continuing through the Mato Grosso. So when you have a choice between channels, it's generally obvious which one to go. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and, and I guess, it, I mean, part of this is one thing to create the maps, it's another thing to then not, let, not get lost, um, even when you're trying to use the maps and um, in terms of recognizing features and, and, and knowing you are where you, where you think you are. Um, and um, I mean, did you have uh, many challenges with uh, navigating with those charts once, once you uh, once you are on the water? Not really. And in fact, um, when the river portion of the voyage was over and I was back out in the oceans again, in the Atlantic Ocean, I chose to continue with that process. I didn't bother to get Garmin chart. I just made my own charts, even though then I was, even though then I was in salt water and I could have done so. Yeah, wow, that's a great story. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. I hmm. never, never would have thought about some of those things that you'd have to, to be able to create like that to be able to do what you did. Well, it, it's to point out um, when you're in a, on a shallow draft boat, you don't need to know the depth. Get it? Mm. Um, yeah, it, of course. A shallow draft boat, you're not going to hit anything. If you yeah. don't see a rock, you're not going to hit a rock. Yeah, if you can't see it, you're not going to hit it when it's a six, six, six inch draft. Right. Yeah. So the, the, much of the, most of the not information on a, on a typical nautical chart is not necessary to a mm. boat such as ours. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and what, I mean, what was, what, did you have any um, health, health emergency or medical, medical emergencies that you had to deal with in, in, that, in that five year period? Well, we were pretty careful about um, uh, not getting bit by mosquitoes and we succeeded in that. We did not get any um, mosquito or, you know, um, smaller noceum you know, born diseases. There are many of those. And um, we had relatively few gastrointestinal problems. We did have a few here and there, but mostly we were careful about the water sources. By the way, the water to be drank is of a variety. Sometimes there you'll be where there's a relatively modern city with a suitable municipal water source that you can fill up at. Um, other times there won't be that, but you'll find the bottled water. And mm -hmm. then other times you, you, we would use a, a filter situation, a, a pump filter. And um, so as long as you have good water, you shouldn't have gastrointestinal problems. And um, <clears throat> uh, we didn't have too many other problems. I think we had some skin infections occasionally. Um, and then, but then a big thing that it came up was Jenny getting pregnant. This was intentional. We, um, we found ourselves on the Rio Madeira. That's a major tributary of the Amazon flowing in from the south. We we're going south on it. That means upstream. Mm -hmm. And it again is a very big river. These rivers are so big, they have sea horizons. You generally can't see land on some portion of the horizon. This is the case of the Madeira too at first. Mm -hmm. And um, we just decided that the riverine portion of the trip was, was quite safe and sane. We could have a child here. And so we, we conceived it and then uh, had that baby. 
uh, obviously nine months later in, um, it was where the countries of uh, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Brazil come together. We were welcomed by people in all those countries to have the baby there, but we chose Brazil. Well, we didn't know for sure just when we would, if, if our timing was correct to reach our chosen place of birth, um, which we chose a certain town called um, Foz do Iguaçu in Brazil. So we were, uh, we had a book called Where There Is No Doctor. This is the book you carry when you're where there is no doctor. And it even includes how to have, how to, how to midwife a birth. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't have to do that. We made it, you know, and to the place, and we went to a regular hospital. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, that's um, it's amazing. Uh, and then, and from so from there, how once um, the child was born, um, how long did you spend ashore before you continued on again yeah. on the next leg? Right, we got to Foz do Iguaçu, which is the location of the famous Iguaçu Falls, one of the most yeah. famous waterfalls in the world, and. Um, we, for a couple of weeks, we were still just in the boat on a, on a bank. And then we found a apartment that would let to us for just one month. Mm -hmm. we, we were there for two weeks before the birth and two weeks after the birth. And then we proceeded. We just carried the baby with us um, <clears throat> for another several months. We were going up the Rio Paraná and um, then we got to the headwaters of that. We we went up the Paraná, and it's very you know the name changes as you as you go into the tributaries that you have chosen to be your route. That the name changes three times, but mm -hmm. the final stream that that you're on is um, you're going up it until even a six foot six inch draft can't make it any further. But we did make it to where there was um, a, a road and a suitable bank that it could be pulled out by human power, by who the people there, you know, you, you, you get four guys or something and if you have, we have found a truck to take us to the next um, put in and the guys help us put it into the back of that truck. And um, so that's, that's, that's as long as we, well, we had to go back to the United States at that point because Brazil allows tourists only to be there for six months then they have to be gone for six months. So we went back to the United States and then we came back and we resumed from the same place. We again with the baby, but the baby is now closer to one year old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then uh, we, continued, we continued all three of us together and down the next river, which flows north, we are coming back now. So we're going yeah. north, north downstream on this other whole big river system called the Araguaia Tocantins. And um, until we got to its mouth, which is at Belém. And then we had to split up because the saltwater portions remaining to get back to the United States would not be at all safe or suitable for uh, a wife and baby. So they mm -hmm. flew back and I continued by myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, how long did it take you from there to, to sail home? It was five months that I was trying to sail home and I made it about two thirds of the way, but um, at the at my arrival at um, the Dominican Republic, I, I misread a situation and um, pitch poled in surf and lost the whole rig, mm. masts and sails, and I lost my whole rowing station and I lost my power and I sold the boat at that point. The hull was okay, but mm. I I just sold the boat to somebody on the beach. And yeah. flew home because I didn't want to be. I could have figured that out with another five months, but I didn't want to stay a, away from my family for that long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, that takes another perspective um, when you've got a you know, a young and growing baby to to factor into the plans as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, that's amazing, Steve. They really what a fascinating story. By the way, um, the 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 flags in the background for whoever has video those are the flags that we obtained and flew during the trip. And um, I, they, you can't see all the way from left to right, but it starts with the United States and ends with Brazil. It does, we didn't get flags for all the countries, but we've got a lot of flags. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's great. I wonder, I wonder what the story was with those. So um, that's good to know. Um, and um, so 
in terms of did you have any challenges dealing with um officials when it came to board, border crossings and movement between countries mm -hmm. well we um we got i think taken advantage of a couple of times in nicaragua and venezuela and not very well treated in um argentina um and uh but we always you know plowed our way through um <clears throat> we our rule was to um observe all formalities uh and that that was our rule until towards the end and then that five last five months in which i was just by myself i i i threw that rule to the wind because coming up through the um caribbean especially where there's all the there's all the guyanas there are three guyanas and then there's all the little tiny island countries that's too much hassle to be clearing into and out of all those i just said heck with it i'm i'm just going you know i might come on shore to reprovision illegally but i'm just going to do it and, and i made it yeah. through that okay but um it's it was uh, it's a ha it's it's all that is a source of hassle but we didn't get thrown in jail ever, you know. None of the bribes were very big. <laughs> we did have to pay some bribes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That's good. Um, um, okay. So um, once you, I mean, I'm keen to understand once you, once you returned home. I mean, what, what, what happened? What happened next? Because this is a big change after, after you know, best part of five years. Yeah. Well. To fit it into a picture for me uh, and how I look at it, how it's happened for me is that um, the the wanderlust that impels one towards this is a um, it's like a renewable source, but it is also a um, use upable source. You use it up, you get to the bottom of it, and then you're then you then you have it out of your system, but then it builds back up again. So it, it just so happens that I've been on three what I will call limitless travels, travels in which there is no time limit and you don't know exactly just where you're going to go, but you go as long as this wanderlust lasts. I've had three of them and they are 18 years apart from each other. So it seems as if I have this constant flow of waterless, wanderlust buildup and every 18 years is when it builds up to where I, the bam bursts, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that, has what, that is what has happened. It happens to have been every 18 years. And so I'm, I'm now in between you know i'm i'm not all built filled up with wanderlust up to here and and i'm leading a, a normal life where we're raising our two boys we have the one that was born during the voyage and we've had another boy since then and um we we live um in the in a house that i was raised in in, in a in a residential area of a small city in a rather normal life and how, how have your i guess how have your it, it, open-ended adventures changed the kind of parent that you've become with the, your outlook on the world versus some of the more traditional outlooks you know within a within a career and within a suburb and within mm -hmm. within a home and you know mm -hmm. within a small community yeah well there's another another big reason why i'm not a, a traditional parent and that's that my wife is much younger than me and i had i've had, I had my children when I, when I was in my upper 50s and lower 60s so I'm a I'm a retired parent. When when somebody sees me with my kids, they they're likely to think I'm their grandpa, but I'm yeah. not, you know. So I don't I don't leave the house to go to work like most dads do. Um, but I, I stay busy, you know. They see that I do work, but yeah. Um, I I'm I'm a different dad than the other kids' dads, you know. I um, I have time to take my boy personally to kindergarten and drop them up and come and pick them up but um aside from that um people sometimes ask well george who was born during the voyage in brazil is he like showing traits of wanting to do this himself the answer to that is no he doesn't seem to be interested in boats to you know he's only nine he knows no what he'll uh, want to do and um so we we're not really concerned about what he chooses to do, nor nor do I think that they are going to want to go on some kind of Swiss Family Robinson voyage with me. I have no reason to think that they will. I am building a boat. I'm building a new boat. So if they, it's larger, and so if they wanted to, I actually could. They yeah. could. If they want to come with me, that's fine. I, the, we will be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what kind of boat are you building? I am building a proa, and this proa is 30 feet long, 
it's there are three kinds of proa. There's the Polynesian, the Atlantic, and the tacking. This is a tacking proa. Mm -hmm. I will define that if you need further definition. That would be great. Okay. Well, the Polynesian proa keeps the ama. The ama is the outrigger. Uh, the Polynesian proa keeps the ama to windward, which is a sort of aggressive style because it unweights as the weight gets stronger. The Atlantic proa keeps the ama to lee which is a more safe and sane approach, but attacking proa has a dedicated stern and a dedicated bow. So it tacks the same way as any other boat. Those other two ones, they have to shunt. It's a different kind of coming about. They don't exactly come about at all, they shunt, but the boat, my boat um, will tack. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how far are you into that project? It's about half done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, 30 feet long. Um, the um, uh, the main hull is only two feet wide on its waterline. So it's a 15 to one length to beam ratio. That's why you have the capability of not having, you have no hull speed limitation. You just have a power limitation. There's no, there's no bow wake that will ever stop you. It's mm -hmm. just a question of how much power you're going to apply. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, that's great. Well, um, so Steve, is there, I mean, you've, You've, uh, I read, I read um, that uh, if uh, people, and I did it myself, if they Google the adventures of Ginny and Steve, um, they'll find your travel blog um, with all of your posts and photos. And, and, and so, um, and, you know, there's some amazing, amazing collection of um, photos and, and the travel blog as was, as was written across the course of the journey. But where's your book available from the five year voyage? Um, we can, if somebody wants to read the book by Stephen Ladd, that's Stephen with a P and Ladd, Ladd L A D D. Um, mm -hmm. where can they buy the book, the five year voyage? Uh, both my books are available anywhere, including mm -hmm. Amazon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'll just, um, I'll, I'll find a link to those as well and link to those from the podcast website too. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do have a website that, that, it, that um, includes other writings I have that mm -hmm. I've written that aren't published. So if anybody's interested in my writing, they should go to my website. It talks about my two books and the other things. And it's um, www.steven with a ph hyphen lad, ladd.com. Okay, that's great. And um, but Steve, before we wrap up, is there any, anything else you want to touch on that we didn't, we didn't spend time on? Anything else you want to share or any advice to budding adventures out there who are sitting on their sitting in their living rooms, pondering whether they should go or stay. Mm. I think we've covered it pretty well. Um, it's a lot of fun and uh, it, it turned out well for us. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I think it sums up really well. So um, we'll see. Thanks so much for appearing on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And um, it's been a real, real pleasure to meet you and to, uh, to talk with you. And I, I look forward to taking a leisurely stroll through your book and reading it um till it's full yeah. of scene now um after talking with you and yeah um the the books are they're major when when in both cases when i got done or when we got done with the voyage i spent another five or seven years you know writing this book these um these are major major events you know <clears throat> and um so i hope that people uh, take advantage of that and see yeah, what absolutely. i've got to say yeah I think absolutely and and, and also that they're, they're full of great images and and maps and charts and, and oh, yeah. of your adventures so they really they're really engaged it's really engaging to read that's for sure yeah my my new book has nine maps that i made myself mm -hmm. that's pretty good you know nine yeah. maps yeah, yeah <laughs> not too many yeah. books have nine maps no no especially not um handmade so uh yeah, that's great yeah. well that's great well thanks uh thanks steve we'll uh wrap up there and i'll and i'll, I'll drop your line with some follow-up uh, information Thank you, David. Okay, great. Great talking with you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.